Okay, is the actual immunoglobulin classes and then the individual subclasses. So again, these are the isotypes that we have that are only dependent upon the constant region. I've said that like 20 times by now. There's IgM, IgD, um, IgG, and all of these guys, IgG1, IgD2 uh, through 4, IgA1, IgA2, and then IgE. All of this stuff that we're saying here is a serum here. Um, this doesn't really, uh, I guess, com com give us a lot of information. Again, molecular weight, I can't visualize that. Serum level in adults, that's great. If you're into the med want to go into the medical field, you can determine which one of these is the most abundant versus least abundant uh, in the blood. And what also I think is interesting is the half-lives. Now, this does tell us something. This tells us about the stability of the proteins themselves or how, how much of them is going to be present. Um, in, in, each, in each context. So just um, something that you may want to consider is that there's monomeric IgM and then pentameric IgM, which is connected by this J chain here. This, this connects things. So anything that's not monomeric is going to be involved in this. Uh, IgA also can be uh, dimeric connected by that J chain. The advantages of this is that you have basically just an increased surface area for collisions here that uh, increases the probability of binding to the pathogen or toxin or whatever it is that's not supposed to be there. Okay, so again, we're, we're done talking about the antigen binding site. Now let's talk about how we can control the effects uh, or they control the way that the immune system responds to the antigen, okay? So the same VH domain can associate with different constant domains after antigen stimulation. This enables B cells to change their effector functions the response that the immune system is going to have. Uh, and this is known as isotype class or isotype switching. So, it's, so this is really important and a really, I think, an impressive thing here. And that this is extremely well controlled. This is not a random process. This is regulated by cytokines of presumably CD4 helper T cells. Okay, so the switching process occurs sorry, um, by recombination between switch signals with deletion of the intervening DNA. So switch signals are pretty repetitive DNA sequences located in the uh, front of the constant regions. Uh, these tend to be CG rich, um, uh, and they're just basically just uh, very similar if you can think of it as uh, when we talked about the recombination or uh, signal sequences for the others there. Okay, so this is showing us a, a, a long steps in the process that we're talking about when we're undergoing isotype switching. And it, in my opinion, it mirrors what we talked about with the uh, VDJ recombinase uh, and then somatic recombination. So this is the leader sequence here um, of the IgM and the IgD that there's being produced by the B cell even in the naive state. So AID, uh, hopefully you remember that, selectively is going to target the S mu and then S gamma switch regions here. This is AID's action here at the mu and at the gamma sequences. So we're really, uh, I guess, putting selective structures in between the two. So DNA in these are going to be nicked on both strands, which you can't really see here, but if you look really closely, you can see that the DNA on top of this has been removed by this. Um, and this is removed through a process or through an enzyme known as, as APE, which again played a similar role when we had talked about uh, somatic recombination. A, a nuclease basically is going to come in and it's going to cut out um, those uh, CGs or whatever it is that was converted after the AID had its action done. Um, so DNA in these are going to be nicked on both strands and then they're going to ha essentially this nicks are going to provide more flexibility which is going to allow for us to form these little looping in and out structures of the switch region and we're going to undergo uh, formation of somatic recombination or if not somatic recombination, I'm sorry, but uh, form of a recombination taking place in the B cells or uh, structures here um, and this is going to produce in this context uh, Ig1 because this is the gamma 1 constant region is the only one that's left. Everything else gets cut out. Now this is just an example for Ig1, but if you could imagine it happening at random points here to give us, say, for example, uh, if it cut out, um, say, only remaining part of it would be uh, constant gamma 3, this would be Ig3, and so on and so forth. So um, that's the, the, the mechanism behind it. I think there's some really cool videos on YouTube showing... Uh, 
step-by-step uh, -step, uh, details of that, and I'll talk about that mechanism in my map after this. But um, this is just shows you the function of, of each of these that you should really pay attention to. So we have IgM um, is one of the very few that actually functions in neutralization um, of pathogen. It's also activation of complement, but it does not act as an oxidant, and it doesn't work with natural killer cells, and it doesn't work with other inflammatory cells. IgD... <laughs> Um, for, for all of these, not really a, a function of, of that. We'll talk about IgD later. Um, IgG, however, neutralization, obstinin, sensitization for killing by natural killer cells. Nice. It's working with that. I love that. Uh, mast cells, inflammatory, and then activation of complements here. So obviously they're a little bit effective here, but they're not as effective at the activation of complement as the IgM was. Ig2, IgG2, really effective as neutralization. Opsonization, we're not quite sure about. Uh, sensitization, no, no. It activates complement, but it's not super efficient at it. And we'll talk about the structures and why we're, this is the process that it gives. For three, neutralization. It's a kind of a weak opsonin or medium strength opsonin. Medium strength with dealing with neutrophils, weak with dealing with mast cells, but really strong at activating complement. Um, same thing with Ig. Uh, well, with Ig4, which you'll see is that it only does neutralization. This is kind of a weird outlier, or a goofy one. Um, does not activate complement. Does not work with mast cells. In fact, it has anti-inflammatory properties, which we'll talk about later. So IgA <laughs> neutralization, mild opsonin, not sensitive, uh, not really good with working with natural killer cells. Doesn't work with mast cells barely activates complement, and if you think about the region where it's located in, you'll know that pretty well. So IgE, I like to think of this as E as it works with allergies. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, but this works with sensitization of mast cells, and that's pretty much the only thing that it does. So this also gives us a uh, unique structures here about uh, the properties of these transport across the epithelia, IgM, yes, and then IgA. Oh yeah, IgA is really abundant in our saliva, which is why a dog's mouth is cleaner than a human's, because it produces a lot of uh, IgA antibodies in the dimeric form, which is going to increase its binding affinity. Uh, transportation across the placenta. So look at this. This is the IgG antibodies that have a really high affinity for transporting across the placenta. I don't know if you know this, but um, infants have been diagnosed with HIV because they have antibodies to the HIV. That's what they were doing. It was an ELISA test. And then I think that that's pretty funny to me because where does the kid's antibodies come from? Mom, the IgG antibodies do go up in, in serum value when patients are infected with HIV. And so they kids were diagnosed with HIV when they, they weren't to have HIV, they just got the, the, the antibodies from mom. Um, diffusion into extravascular sites, again, IgG is really efficient at that. IgA in the monomeric form, kind of efficient, but not nearly as efficient as the IgG subclasses. And then the main serum levels, we don't care about that. Okay, so there's variation in the, the, the FC region or the constant region gives us variation into the structure. It really is this, this balancing act, and this is what I'm drawing here as a balance, like those really old ones that they have from like, I think it was the, the uh, Egypt, from the Arabian Nights or something like that. But anyways, um, so this balancing act that we have with the stability of the disulfide bonds and then the actual flexibility of the hinge regions. Let me go ahead and just switch colors to, to really, so we have the disulfide bonds on one end, which are offering us very, very much stability. And then on the other end though, we also have to balance that with flexibility, which gives us uh, stronger functions. Uh, and so that's what this is talking about, this balancing act between those two things there. Okay, so the four subclasses of IgG obviously differ greatly in the structure of the hinge and differ greatly with how uh, vulnerable they are to cleavage by certain proteases. Obviously, Ig3 is the most flexible one, but it's going to be the most vulnerable and the least stable one, whereas the least flexible one, I believe, is Ig1, uh, which, well, I mean, it's intermediate flexibility, but it's, it's not going to be able to bind are not going to be able to be as flexible as the others here. Okay, 
So they have different uh, complexity and functions of antibody structure and generation of B cell diversity. Um, this is kind of stuff that we've already sort of talked about. One of the things that you may want to notice about is the number of disulfide bonds at the hinge regions here. There's 11 here with this, uh, two with this, and then four here. Uh, only two for IG4, which we'll talk about that. Um, susceptibility of hinge uh, uh, of cleavage by proteolytic cleavage. Uh, IG3 being the most flexible is the most susceptible to cleavage there. Um, the half-life that we have in serum, this isn't nearly as stable, so it doesn't last as long as the others do. Um, and then capacity to activate complement. Yeah, this guy is going to, why does it have a higher capacity to activate complement, might you be asking? Because it has a higher range of flexibility, and therefore it's going to bind to pathogens or toxins or whatever with more efficiency. Um, response to carbohydrate antigens, not so much, but response to allergens, in this context, IG4, uh, this is so crazy to me that this is actually anti-inflammatory. It, it, it calms down your, your inflammatory responses. It does not act to increase it. it it's, it's an antihistamine, if you can think of it. It's not, well, not literally an antihistamine, but the phenotypic effects of it are similar to that of antihistamines. Okay. So IG4 is really weird. It's really different. Um, it's functionally monovalent. And what this picture shows is that they have two different antigen binding sites on their molecules um, on either side of it. So it, it doesn't really function um, in anything. So let's just go ahead and just write, draw with IG4, the two things that it can do. It can act, it can do neutralization, but it's not, you wouldn't want to send it after some viruses. Um, neutralization and then I'm just going to say anti-inflammation. My handwriting is getting really bad. Um, tendonitis, right, layout, so I can't really write with a whole lot of oomph to it. This marker is really bad. But anyways, that's that. Okay. So this is a, just a generalized overview of all the things that happen of changes in the immunoglobulin genes during a B cell's life. So we have somatic recombination of the genomic DNA. This is obviously irreversible. Uh, which we talked about that with the RAG complex and all that stuff, the V, D, and the J segments coming together. We have generation of junctional diversity. That's with the P and N nucleotides insertions. We have assembly of transcriptional controlling elements, um, which is the promoter enhancer being brought closer together by the V region assembly, the actual cutting and pasting process that we talked about there. Um, and then transcription, um, that we can do alternate RNA splicing for both the IgM and IgD isotypes, but also to change from the membrane secreted the soluble, the insoluble form to the soluble form. This is obviously reversible. Somatic hypermutation is not reversible, and neither would be isotype switching. So cool. Um, I'm not really going to go into much detail on this, but let's just mention some, some definitions that we want to talk about. Affinity just means the strength of binding at a single site. I hope you already know that. You should know that from general biology. Avidity, though, is the total of the binding strength from all the sites combined. Um, so if we have a pentameric IgM, it's going to have a very good binding avidity um, when each and every one of these has a low binding affinity individually. Think of it as the German Tiger, German Panzer, versus the small Sherman tanks that um, the Americans were using, uh, quantity versus quality, if you can think of it that way. Um, isotype differences between antibodies are determined by their constant regions. You should know that by now. Uh, ideotypic differences arise when individual antibodies differ in the variable regions. For example, IgG, uh, anti-MUPS virus, versus the IgE for anti-measles virus, They're, the antigen binding site does not give a flying fuck about what the FC region looks like. It, it's it, totally separate things there. So uh, allotypic differences arise due to genetic variation or polymorphism in the heavy and light chain uh, of regions of between members of the same species. Remember, allelic variation means that we only have one light chain and only one of the uh, heavy chain that are going to be selected for this process here. 